Well, good morning, everybody. Well, happy Easter. Come on, on your feet, dear ones. It's great to have you with us today. And uh, we're just here to celebrate the resurrection of our Saviour from the dead. What a glorious day it is to come together and celebrate on such a day like today. You know, the Scripture tells us in Deuteronomy uh, 16, because there were seven feasts that Israel celebrated. And the first feast was the Feast of the Passover with the Feast of Unleavened Bed and the Bread and the Feast of the First Fruits. But the Lord said, when you come together with the feast time, rejoice. And God wants you to be rejoicing today. And of course, our great cause for rejoicing, that He that dead, He that was dead, He is now alive forevermore. And the reality of all the promises of God are just so can be so absolutely impacting upon our lives. And God's grace wants to flow into your hearts. And so it is that we're here to celebrate. And the Bible says the Father raised Him from the dead by the Spirit of holiness. And it proved to be that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. Come on, lift your hands together. I love to start our service every Sunday with the Lord's Prayer. I just feel so impacting upon my life. And the Lord's Prayer in its simplicity is about God's purpose, about God's provision, and about God's protection. Father, we thank You for Your Son. We thank You that You raised Him from the dead. We thank You, the Lord God, that You are so for us and not against us. We bless Your wonderful Name. Having made us in our image, we men brought sin into the world, but we know that by this man, Jesus, hallelujah, He brought life into the world. And we thank You for Him. And so let's say this prayer after me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come and Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For Yours is the kingdom, Yours is the power, Yours is the glory forever. Amen. So you ready to celebrate today? Because He wants you to celebrate. It's time for joy to take a hold of your hearts. Because He lives, you shall live also. Amen. Wish I could describe it, but I can contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture. There aren't enough words to ever say what I found. That's 
my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor.
Open door 
We need, we need, we need more of Him, don't we? We need to believe in what He did and what He promised us. You know, this is His table. We celebrate communion this morning because it's His table. He invites you to come to His table. And He wants you to eat. He wants you to remember what He's done for each and every one of us. The Scripture says that He tasted death for each and every one of us. That is that He entered into death. And He did something incredible. He paid the price, the penalty. He took the judgment for our sins upon Himself. And the Scripture tells us very clearly, and I love this verse out of Romans where it says, if when we were enemies, that is enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through His death, the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved. We're all aware of our mortality. And life in many ways through this journey is sweet. And yet at times it's challenging and there's bitterness, but He can bring sweetness. He can make the bitter sweet. And the Scripture says because of His death, the death of His Son, we're reconciled. But not only are we reconciled, we'll be saved by His life. Jesus wanted to eat with His disciples before His crucifixion. And he said, I want you to eat this bread. This is my body, which is broken for you. It was for you he did it. It wasn't for himself. And this is my blood, which was shed for you. And I want you to believe in me. I want you to enter into a covenant relationship with me. Because I'm for you. I just love him so much that I'm so undeserving of that which he has done. but I believe in Him. And I trust Him as I consider what He's done for me and what He's done for all of us. And there are miracles that can happen in your life in this journey. And His power is released to you to, for you to experience His grace and the abundance of His mercy that He wants you to wants it to flow out of your heart to others because what God has done for you He will do for others and as we come to this table I don't want to give a theological lesson or anything like this but listen to this I love this scripture where it says since by man came death now there was man that brought death into this world not God by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And there will be a glorious day, a glorious day, when the dead in Christ, those that really believe in Him, shall be raised. For the Bible says, as in Adam we all died, even so in Christ we shall be made alive. Jesus hasn't come to condemn you. He's come to make you alive. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to make you alive. To alive to a world around you that needs Him. To alive to a relationship you, we, we desperately need with God. And you've been created in His image and His likeness. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to work through us. He wants to show the riches of His grace throughout the ages toward us. Stand together. And let's, on this resurrection morning, know that He is alive. And you have in your hands these, hands these emblems that simply refer to His sacrifice. Jesus is God's Lamb. As we understand that the Saviour didn't come as a militant Messiah. The Jewish people were expecting Him to come this way. He will come eventually again, the second time. 
as a militant Messiah. But the first time, He came as a Saviour for all of humanity. And as you hold His bread in your hand, remember that His body was broken for you. You didn't break it, He broke it. He said, I offered Himself for us. So let's eat together in remembrance of Him. And His blood was shed for you, for me, so we could have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. So let's drink together. At this time of the year, as the brethren are coming and picking up the the things the emblems were held in, we only sing this song at this Easter morning service. We don't sing it in any other time of the year. But He lives. And there's a release of His resurrection power. And His resurrection power is in this meeting today to release to change, to make whole. And if you just open your heart and let the Spirit of God work within your heart and life, don't look at yourself, look at Him. Look away from yourself, look at Him. For there is a release that will come to your heart and to your life, spiritually, physically, emotionally, psychologically. Change will come by your faith in Him who is alive from the dead. And so as we're gonna sing, as we always do, just this time of the year. Are you ready? Let's do it together. One, two, three, four.
I have to wait every 12 months to sing it because it just wanted to be a tradition in the fellowship that uh, we enjoy so much together. In the book of the Ephesians, Paul is, has a prayer. His prayer in chapter one is about the power of God. In chapter three, it's about the love of God. And it finds, he says here, that the eyes of your understanding should be enlightened, that you might know what is the hope of His calling. And what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believed? According to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in heavenly places, far above every principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He wants you to know the exceeding greatness of His power. I know we've had only just a little taste. Would you be seated for a moment? We're here to receive an offering from you this morning as we do on Sundays in our fellowship. You know, we've had meetings on Friday and Saturday. We didn't take up any offerings because we want you to come and receive. We just want you to be blessed. But the Scripture tells us in Deuteronomy, and we understand that, that uh, we as a people of God uh, are just celebrating His resurrection. But the resurrection is the feast of the first fruits. And in the Passover, there was, as people know it, the Passover, there was the feast of unleavened bread and the feast of the first fruits. And the feast of the first fruits is about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Do you know the Scripture tells us that He was the first that was resurrected from the dead? If you look at the life of Jesus, He raised people from the dead. But they weren't resurrected to immortality. I reckon it would have been disappointing to knowing that to pass through the veil again. But it was that Jesus was the first. And the Bible tells us clearly in the book of Deuteronomy that when we come and to celebrate His feasts, we should be coming and celebrating His feast with joy. He wants to be rejoicing in Him. He wants us to be glad as we draw near to Him. The Scripture tells us, enter into His gates with thanksgiving and come into His courts with praise. And the Scripture says this clearly, that as you're celebrating these feasts, He said, and He's talking about the different feasts in, in Deuteronomy 16. He said, three times a year, all your males shall appear this is for the Jewish community, shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which He chooses. And at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Passover, connected the Passover and the first fruits, and the Feast of Weeks, and that's Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. In other words, we've come to celebrate. We've come to honour Him. And we've come to give from our substance, in honouring of Him. We're so glad for what He's done for us. We believe that as we sow a seed, that which He's given to us, God is gonna bless us because we're honouring Him today with our offerings, with our tithes, with our gifts, with our support to those that are on the mission fields in Africa and in, in, in Israel and in India. It is that God is doing a wonderful work of grace as the message is being carried and you're a part of it and you're supporting it and you will reward, be rewarded for it because we're assisting those that have gone to places that we haven't gone, can't go, wouldn't be able to eat the food, wouldn't be able to live there for any length of time, but they've done it because they were called to do it. But God has called us to assist them. So let's all stand together as we prepare to give today in honouring of our Master because He's blessed us so much. Father, we bring to you that which we want to honour your Son. He's our High Priest. He's our Melchizedek. And we bless His name together. That as we have partake of the wine and the bread, so it is we bring to you that which you have blessed us and favoured us with. And to you be the glory. May our lives always reflect your goodness. May our lives always shine out the light of your kindness. And we thank you that we can honour you in this way this day by bringing you a substance that our, we've earned with our intelligence and with the sweat of our brow, our substance of which 
we know, Lord Jesus, will be used for the betterment and the extension of the gospel in this part of the world and in other parts of the world as well. In Jesus' name, we thank you for this privilege to honour you. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So please, brethren, come to me first. Hallelujah. And um, you may be seated, but we're going to, for the last time, I want to sing this song one more time because we won't be singing again until 2025 in this house. Resurrection power. I love that, I love that lyric where it says, I know I've just only had a little taste. I remember the day that, that I was born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. I remember that day when I drove home from work a Friday afternoon in the year of 1965. That was last century. I know I don't look that old, but and I don't feel that old either. But the reality is that was last century. And I remember because I was challenged in my heart, what will I do with Jesus? What do you think of Jesus? As a man was sharing with me, the, place, the workplace where I was, and I drove home that Friday afternoon and went to the place where I was staying and went into the bedroom where I was sleeping at night and knelt beside the bed and said these simple words, not knowing how, what would happen in my life, what God would do with my life. I just said, Lord, I wanna serve you. I didn't know what that meant, but I was 100% committed to Him and something happened. There was a young lady who I was very much in love with and we went out that night, as we do on the Friday evening in that part of the world. And as I was driving my car and we were going to the place, she said, you're different. I said, something's happened to me. And I don't know, I can't explain it. All I know is it's real. And I didn't realize until a little later on when I was looking at the Scriptures that I had experienced what Jesus had said, you must be born again. I believed in Him. I committed my life to Him. And something happened to my heart. And from that time, I was changed. People say, is it true? Well, if anybody will know you could be changed, it's the person that you're married to. I remember when I were, in my 40th year, um, I was pastoring here. Um, the church was quite small at that time. And I had some challenges in my life to be able to share the Word of God with people who maybe a little reluctant to receive it. And I went home and I was sharing with my wife and I said, honey, boy, um, it's tough because some people are reluctant to receive the truth and yet the truth will set them free. And I said, it's, I'm struggling in myself. And she said, um, she opened the fly leaf of a Bible and said, I want to read something. The Lord spoke to him many years previously and said, by the time your husband is 40, he won't be the man you married. He'll be a tree of righteousness. He'll be the planting of the Lord. I looked at her across the table and she shared this with me. I was 40 years of age. The Lord prepared it. It was change coming in my life. And she could see the changes. And sometimes the changes are so small, incremental changes, like a child that's growing up. And we might measure them against the doorpost, but we don't see it day, weekly, monthly. And yet we see it maybe six months, got to get a new pair of shoes because they're too small, a bigger pair of strides because they're too tight, a bigger shirt because it's too small. But growth is taking place. But sometimes we don't see it, but we know it's happening inside of us. And you'll become the man and the woman that God wants you to be and do the things that God would have you to do. Hallelujah. Change comes by the power of God in our lives as we believe in Him. And you know, there's that lyric, I know I've just had a little taste. But on that great and final day when the trumpet sounds. You know, I see signs happening all around me. I want you to know I believe that Jesus could come at any moment. I've believed it all my life ever since I've been saved but I haven't sat on my backside doing nothing. I've been busy doing what I want because I want Him to be pleased with me when He sees me. I want Him to say to me, well done, good and faithful servant. Doesn't matter what others say, what does He say? But I believe He can come at any moment. And I just said the other day, I heard somebody say, I'm no longer looking for the signs. 
I'm listening for the sounds. The scripture says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be changed and we shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Until that time, I'm gonna keep busy doing what he wants me to do, but I'm gonna keep looking. And because he lives, we shall live. You know, he was the first to be resurrected. First to put on this immortality of a body. And when he was resurrected, the disciples said to me, he said, look, I'm not a ghost. I've got flesh and bone as you see me have. Give me something to eat. I'll show you that I'm not a ghost. I'm alive from the dead. Wow. He wants to reveal himself to you in his heart. Because he loves you so much. And so we're going to sing for the last time. We won't be singing it tonight. Resurrection power. Come on now. Stand and sing it with your best, 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 best voice. Lift up your voice and declare it to Him that you believe in what He said, you believe in what He promised, and you believe it's going to happen to you in Jesus' name. Amen. One, two, three, four. Resurrection power.
have a time of holy convocation. And it seems to be now we're running in tandem that every second year we have a good friend of the house, a friend of our family who comes and ministers and alternatively. So in Easter, where are we? 2024, 20, Easter 26, he'll be back at Easter again. Next Easter, most likely will be Mark Elgin. But God knows why he's here. And I'm so glad he's here. And you know, all around the world, he's moving all around the world. And in, in places around the world, he's preaching in stadiums where there's thousands of people. But um, it so happens that he wants to be with us every second year. Because he has something on his heart that he wants to share with us. Because he believes that God's for us. And God's got something for us to do. So put your hands together for my uh, Shane Willard. Good morning, everybody. You can be seated. It's so good to be with you on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, if you want to follow along in an actual Bible, Acts 17, we're going to get to that in just a second. If not, we've created some really easy to follow along with um, slides. It's always good to be with my Rockhampton family um, here at, at COP. I think we figured out today that the first year I came was 2006, and uh, we've just been coming by every year, um, every other year on the Easter's, and then in the odd years, I come in the winter, and um, just to, to take us on a journey. And it's, it's an honor to open the Bible today. Um, when I, I take that very seriously, anytime I do that, I want Jesus to get bigger, the cross to work better, the resurrection to be central, and scriptures to get bigger, not smaller. I hope that's your experience. We're just going to ask two questions when we look at scripture. One, what happened? And two, more importantly, what's happening in me right now because of, of what happened? And so after this is over, um, in the four year there, we have a small table set up with our teaching resources in audio and video and USB. The reason we do that is because we live with the conviction that we're not simply called to go to heaven when we die. We're called to bring heaven to every place we see hell here. And so we use the money from that to create a fund that helps us do missions in the world. Our mission of choice are three children's homes in China that look after children with mental disabilities and physical disabilities. Two in Hinyang, one in Changsha. There's six brand new ones since the last time I was here. There's a whole course on the book of Romans, which is Paul's genius, genius homily about how we should live in light of resurrection. Um, it's, then there's one on Genesis. Um, also just finished uh, a 12-part series on the life of Jesus and what it teaches us about how to impact our world. And so all that's out there. There's all kinds of other stuff as well. Um, the only thing I would ask you to do is that if you don't want anything, God bless you. I'll see you tonight. If you know you're going to grab something today, if you could do so in the first 10 minutes or so, um, that would be awesome. That way, uh, the person they have helping me doesn't have to stand there for 40 minutes because this church has a chatting afterwards culture. And I think, that's, I think that's great. That's better than people who don't like each other. But if you could do that, that would be fantastic. So we've been journeying through Easter. And we've been talking about the implications of living out of resurrection. And, and without re-preaching any of it, uh, we've talked about having a table culture instead of a tablet culture. Having, having a table culture instead of a tower culture. We talked about the role of repentance. Uh, we talked about resisting Babel. We talked about dealing with the gap between our expectations and our reality. Th this morning, I, I want to talk to you about how we live in our world in light of resurrection. How do you present resurrection to the world? Th that Jesus is not an argument to win. He, he is a life to demonstrate. And that's two different things. People who see Jesus as an argument to win, they end up complaining about darkness, whereas leaders turn on the light. That's two different things. Showing people, demonstrating instead of announcing. I'll, I'll start this with a, a, a story. It's a true story um, that illustrates this morning's message really, really well. Um, so one of the things I get asked to do everywhere now, I mean, I'm talking well into the 80% of churches that have me, they put aside one session for just open Q&A. Let's have an open discussion about whatever you want to talk about. I really like that because it's organic, and it allows me to gauge what people actually are interested in instead of a monologue. And so I was in this Q&A. And some of them are dangerous. So one q and I was in, uh, there was like, I don't know, 2,000 people. And there was a QR code behind me. And it said, ask him anything, right? And what could go wrong? You know, seriously. And so, and so I, I've done that. This was a, a smaller, medium-sized Q&A. A little over 100 people probably. And, and this lady asked me a question. And I'm going to quote her. Uh, quote, Shane, I'm being tormented for my faith in Jesus at my place of work. Do you have any advice for me? 
So let me repeat that. I'm being tormented because of my faith in Jesus at my place of work. Do you have any advice for me? Important context, this was in Australia. So she caught me at a time where I was just tired enough to be really articulate, right? And um, when I get tired, I don't get mean, I, I get articulate. And, um, and so I just looked at her and said, I don't believe you. And it, there was a shock, like this tense in the, like everybody tensed up in the room. She said, what? I said, I didn't stutter. I, 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 I don't believe you. I said, but let, let me let you off the hook. I don't think you're lying. A lie is an intent to deceive. I don't think you're trying to deceive me. I just don't believe you're being tormented because of your faith in Jesus at work. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you mean to tell me you're the first one in and the last one to leave and you're known for having the highest work ethic, the highest integrity, the highest level of compassion, the highest level of generosity, the highest level of peacemaking skills that you turn the other cheek, you go the extra mile, you give your tunic and your cloak and you readily put people above yourself and people don't like you. I don't believe you. She was a little shocked. She told me I helped her. I said, great. So we had a chat afterwards, and I did help her, because here's what she did. She did what all of us can be guilty of doing, and that is this. She crossed a line in her place of work where she saw Jesus as an argument to win instead of a life to demonstrate. Here's what she was doing. She was weaponizing scripture in the general direction of people who have no emotional connection to the scripture, particularly around the area of sexuality. And she was wondering why that wasn't working. And I said, you can't see Jesus as an argument to win. You have to see him as a life to demonstrate. You can't weaponize scripture against people who have no emotional connection to the scripture. Jesus talked about this. He said, if you want to make your world a better place, you got to see yourself as the plank and them as the speck. You can't reverse that. This is, what we, this is how Christians reverse that. They go, you know what, we Christians are flawed, but you're really flipping flawed. That doesn't work. He, here's how Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 5. Based, this is a paraphrase, but basically, what business is it of yours about the immorality of the world? Why would you spend any energy drawing attention to the immorality of the world? That's ineffective. Get your own thing in order. What are you doing? What are you doing? If you don't believe Jesus or Paul, believe Michael Jackson. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. If not Michael Jackson, believe pink. I'm a hazard to myself. Don't let me get me. Now, any topic where Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul, Michael Jackson, and pink agree, there is a high chance that that is a profound truth. And I want to talk to you about that today. Because there's a response to resurrection. We're, we're living in a season that's rare. It's an anthropological thing. I'll leave that for another time. Where people who don't normally ask questions about matters of faith are now asking. They're interested. And, and, and so we have to be able to engage that. And there's a way to engage our world like that lady was. Calling out their immorality. Again, let me quote Paul. What business is it of yours about the immorality of the world? What are you doing? That doesn't work. Don't weaponize scripture against people who have no emotional connection to it. Are you serious? And so I, I want to put some language around this because I think this is going to really help us living out resurrection um, in our world. I think in our world we're going to run into three types of people. And all of us are one of these three types of people. And I'm going to ask you to resist the urge this morning to have this thought. Boy, I hope such and so is listening to this. I get it, I get it, but let's for a second practice plank removal before we practice speck removal. Uh, let, let's say it this way, uh, next, next slide. Uh, some people know it, they just can't name it. Some people name it, too loud in fact, but when you look at their life, they don't know it. Some people have received God's offering for them, but when you look at their life, they haven't offered anything good back. I wrote this kind, I introduced this kind of concept probably six years ago here. And, um, and I was happy with the response, but I wasn't happy with how well I fleshed it out. So I spent some time and fleshed it out. I, I want to talk about this today. Some people know it. They just can't name it. Some people name it too loud. Uh, but when you look at their life, they don't know it. Some people receive God's offering for them. 
but haven't offered anything good back. Let's talk about the first one. Some people know it. They just don't have the ability to name it yet. Eight years ago, there was a man named Sean Penn. Sean Penn was Madonna's ex-husband. He's a famous actor. And he did something unbelievable. He sold everything in his Beverly Hills estate. Everything. And he moved to Haiti and gave it all to the poor. Unbelievable action. Inspiring, actually. When the news asked him, what inspired you to do that? His response was, I can't name it. I can just tell you there was an internal hum in my heart urging me to live my life for the good of others. And I had to say yes. Oof. Some people know it. They just can't name it. This has massive experiential precedence. It also has scriptural precedence. There's a lot of scriptures we could look at. Uh, there's this one time, there's this guy named Cornelius. And Cornelius was a Roman soldier who did not, this is how theologically sound Cornelius was. He did not know Peter wasn't God, right? Now that's pretty untheologically sound. He shows up at Peter's house and he's bowing down to Peter. And Peter has to even start at the most basic theology. I'm not God. Stop bowing to me. That's pretty basic. And Cornelius says, well, why am I here? And Peter says, God chose you to pastor the first Gentile church. And Cornelius asks an obvious question. Why me? I didn't even know you weren't God. And Peter said, because God has already counted you righteous because your generosity to the poor went up as a remembrance to him. Woo. Some people know it. They just can't name it yet. This is time in Acts 17. There's this guy named Paul, and he goes to the Oropagus. Uh, I want to I read this because it's really confronting, and then we're going to talk about it. Um, Paul then stood up at the meeting of the Oropagus and said, You people of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. You believe in God, good for you. For as I walked around, I looked carefully at your objects of worship. That's called idols. I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. So you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. In other words, you know it, you just can't name it. Right. And this is what I'm going to proclaim. Now, this is really challenging. Like Paul is standing in front of almost 100% non-Christian people. And here's what he does. He finds an altar to an unknown God they haven't named, and he simply calls it Jesus. And w Would we be okay with that? Like, seriously, you guys support missionaries. Can you imagine if a missionary showed up here and Pastor Claude said, Hey, Bob, give us an update on what's going on in Cambodia, right? And Bob says, All right, um, I'm a missionary in Cambodia. Thank you so much for your relationship and your support over the last 15 years. I had a real breakthrough the last year. I went to this temple in rural Cambodia, and there was all these gods there. That they, but there was one they haven't named yet, so I just decided to call him Jesus and be done with it because they were already worshiping him. Would we be okay with that? But that, that's what Paul's doing here. He's going, oh, well, there's a thousand gods. Uh, here's one. Hey, an altar to an unknown god. I'm going to call this Jesus. This is really confronting. And then Paul tells us why, and he gives us his logic, and it, it gives us some real wisdom into how to relate to people who have no emotional connection to our spirituality. Watch what he says. Next slide. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he's not far from any one of us. Paul's talking to non-Christian people, affirming that Christ is at work in every single person. Whether you can name it or not, is that's a whole nother thing. But God is at work in every single person. And this is a massive, massive posture that we need to take. Because if we, if we take the posture of us and them in our places of work and in our neighborhoods and in our families, then we'll talk down to them. Labels are for products. Love is for people. As soon as as you label somebody anything other than a human being that God is at work in, we can then justify mistreating them. Paul's affirming that God is trying to reach out to them so that they would reach back. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. So he's fixing to quote an Athenian poet. We are his offspring. Paul is affirming that Christ is at work in these people, and he's even calling them children of God. Ooh, 
what is going on here? Now, you might be thinking, Shane, can you do that thing you do where you tell the history behind something so it makes it make more sense and makes it? Yes, I can. And I'm so glad you asked. So here's the thing. To understand what's going on in this passage, we got to have a three-minute rapid-fire history lesson, right? You're like, I don't like history. Give me a second to redeem your boring history teacher because we're going to have a three-minute rapid-fire history lesson to understand what's going on in this passage, right? This passage comes down to five things. The Oropagus, to the unknown God. There's a guy named Megacles. We'll talk about him in a second. There's a man named Cylon of Athens, and there's a guy named Epimenides. Let's run through these five things in very rapid fire succession. First, the Oropagus. The Oropagus was basically city council of Athens. It's where the people got together and they discuss public policy. It's where we get the word politics from. It's basically discussing policy that would be for the betterment of people. And you could come by the Oropagus and you could introduce a new way of living. And what the people asked was not, was it right or wrong? That was a whole nother thing. It was, do I believe if the whole world converted to this way of living, would the world be better? And if the world was better, then they would start implementing those policies. If they thought if the world was worse, they would kill you, right? So Paul's taking a big risk here. They can't have that getting out. So when people say, oh, I, I, was, I, mm, I was brave this week. I, uh, I, I shared my faith with Sally in accounting. Well, I get it, but, you know, Paul is doing something pretty brave here. And here's the thing. We need to stop and pause and ask ourselves this question. If the whole world converted to how we're thinking about God, would the world be a better place? Pause, at least consider that. If the whole world converted to how I'm thinking about God, would it make the world a better place? And if the answer is no, there's a problem with how we're thinking about God. If the whole world was obsessed with climate change, would the world be better? No. If the whole world was obsessed with other people's sex lives, would the world be better? No. If the whole world was obsessed with politics being the answer, would the world be better? No. If the whole world was obsessed with the end of the world, would the world be better? No. And so they would ask, if they would ask, is this a way that would make the world a better place? So Paul goes there to do this, and he finds an altar to an unknown God. And he's like, hey, you've been worshiping him for years. You don't know his name. I'm going to tell you his name. Now, to understand this, we've got to understand 660 B.C., 700 years before this, there was an Athenian king named Megacles. Now, this is going to sound like a bad Transformers episode, but that's what they named each other back then. Hey, Optimus Prime, it's Megacles. I get it. I get it. This is Megacles. So Megacles was a megalomaniac leader of Athens. He was a king whose policies were enriching the 1% and holding down the 99%, which leads me to Cylon of Athens. Cylon of Athens was basically their representation of parliament of the rule areas. He was the one voice that the poor had, in other words. He was the one sort of social justice activist in this area. And he was very frustrated uh, with Megacles' policy. So he started something called the Cylonic Rebellion. And the Cylonic Revolt or the Cylonic Rebellion was basically, he riled up all the rural folks and he said, hey, he's not listening, let's go teach him a lesson. And a bunch of rural farmers picked up their pitchforks and took on a professional military. This went terribly, right? Megacles squashed this very, very quickly and he lied. And he said, you know what? He said, if you just surrender amicably, I'll just, you, I'll just make you slaves, which was a deal because they were already slaves. And so they laid down their weapons and surrendered to Megacles, and he lied. He used them as a public example not to mess with him. He put them in the center of the city and had wild animals tear them apart. He tied them to horses and have horses pull them apart. He disemboweled people while they were tied up in the city center. Uh, one historian said there was pregnant women with babies hanging out uh, of, their of, of their bellies. This guy was an absolute maniac. And he was in charge of the whole area. Pause. A lack of perspective is the enemy of hope. Be very careful buying into the idea that the world's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. It's not. Listen, that is an anti-Christian idea. The world is being saved by Christ, not destroyed by Christ. Now, is God done redeeming the world? No way. But is it better? Yes. Whatever your problem is with Albo, it ain't Megacles, okay? This was government-sanctioned ripping people apart. And I realize God is nowhere near done, not even close. But it's better. Would you rather be a woman today or 1950? 
That's not a trick. That's uh, Seriously, be a bit more uh, alacritous with that. Would you rather be a woman today or 1950? It's not even close. Or 1850. Is God done redeeming women's rights? No, but it's certainly better. It, what, what, if, would you rather be black today or 1950? Or 1850. Is God done redeeming race relations? No, but it's better. Would you rather go to the dentist today or 1950? <laughs> or 1850. Nothing, nothing is worse today than in Jesus' day. Let me just give you a few things that were legal in Jesus' day, okay? These were legal things. Murder, legal, as long as they were lower class than you. Rape, legal, as long as they were lower class than you. Pedophilia, legal, as long as they were lower class than you. Full birth abortion, legal. You had a healthy kid, you bashed their head. Or you left them on a garbage dump. It was called exposure. It was legal, normal, natural, somewhat expected. Hey, bestiality, legal, normal, expected. As public acts of worship to the goat god Pan in Caesarea Philippi. Yeah, these things were legal. People go, man, the world's crazy these days. What are you talking about? Yes, it, yeah, there's some stuff that needs to be fixed. But my goodness, it's better than that. And that's because of the work of the Spirit of Christ in this world to save it and not destroy it. Heck, nothing's worse than the Roman, heck, nothing's worse than a hundred years ago. Nothing, nothing except pollution. Pollution's worse than a hundred years ago. That's because we invented the internal combustion engine, which basically solved world hunger, and then it created another problem. And, and to be fair, divorces are worse. We're getting more divorces now than ever before, um, and that's not good. It's not good, but, but that's just because of medical advancements. We're living so long. Like, look, In Jesus' day, they died at 32. So till death do us part was more doable. Now you got to live with them to 84. It's a whole thing. Look, can you imagine, can you imagine if your great-great-grandfather came back from the dead and you had two days to explain to him how much worse the world is? Can you imagine that? Be, that's a farce. Like, just imagine the things in your house that would just blow his mind. Ho! Oh, what's that? That's a refrigerator. What's that do? Keeps things cool. Food spoils far less regularly. Wow. Wow, what's that? That's a car. What's that do? Takes us wherever we want to go on a paved road at 100K an hour. Ho! Oh, wow. What's that? That's a tap. What's that do? Brings clean, drinkable water into our house under pressure. What? What's the other tap? That's the hot water. What? You have hot water coming into your house under pressure? Yes. Whoa. Wow, what's that? It's toilet paper. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing, Granddad. Seriously, we saw you collecting corn cobs earlier, but since 1931, we've, we've had this toilet paper thing. It's amazing. Whoa, wow, what's that? That's the wet wipes. What's that do? That's the thing that shows us the toilet paper isn't as foolproof as we thought. <laughs> but, but it's still awesome. It's still awesome. And by the way, even that's getting better. Um, in Japan, uh, they were having trouble with too much toilet paper in their sewers. And so instead of complaining about it, what they did is they invented toilet paper-free toilets. I know, I know. The lady in the back's like, God, that's disgusting. I know, I know. That's because you're picturing one of those little French bidet things. Like, ah, uh -uh. no, 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 no. You go to the toilet in Japan, you better be sure you're done. Because when you hit that button, I'm talking about an 80-horsepower Kubota engine. <laughs> It will lift you off the seat. You can't wait to use the toilet in Japan. Listen, you go to Japan and use the toilet and come back here and use the toilet at the Empire Apartments in Rockhampton, you'll think you're in Sudan or something. Is God done redeeming the world? No. It's certainly better. Back to Megacles. So Megacles... Megacles kills all these people. What happens is, is a plague comes on Athens. And people back then were superstitious. They, they, thought, they thought the gods were in charge of everything. And, and, you know, if they got upset, they'd hurt people. And, you know, things we would never think today. So, this plague comes on Athens, and they had a problem. They had a problem. If the gods are upset, what's the problem? Well, there's a thousand gods, and one of them's ticked off. Well, what do you do? You don't know which ones. Here's what they did. They got together at the Oropagus, and they ordered a uniform sacrifice to all gods everywhere. Saturday at 2, no matter what god you serve, sacrifice. We'll cover our bases. So they did that. 
and it didn't work. So they sacrificed every god, and it doesn't work. So here's what they did. They went and consulted with a Pythian oracle. An oracle in those days was your last line of defense against the gods. It was these weird people who lived in caves and were thought to have special connection to the gods. Think of a scraggly-haired woman in a cave stirring a cauldron, you know, like Clash of the Titans sort of stuff. Anyway, so they go and they talk to her and they say, hey, uh, we sacrificed all the gods and it didn't work. And she said, that's because there's a god you haven't thought of. He's an unknown god and it's him you must appease. They said, well, tell us his name. She said, if I knew his name, he wouldn't be unknown now, would he? Right? you got to go consult with the great Cretan prophet Epimenides. So Epimenides was this famous prophet and poet. He's known as a very wise man. He's quoted three times in the New Testament by Paul, by the way. A guy that's never heard of Jesus gets quoted by Paul because no matter what banner you put it under, truth is truth. So Epimenides goes, they go and consult with Epimenides at Crete, and they pay him a fee to come back to Athens to give him some advice, right? I have a picture of Epimenides, by the way. Here he is. This is Epimenides here. Next slide. There he is. Isn't he something, you know? He looks like Uncle Jesse from the Dukes of Hazard, you know? Or Uncle Herschel from The Walking Dead, depending on your generation. So Epimenides shows up at the steps of the Oropagus, and he's like, oh, man, there's an unknown god. I don't know him either. So here's what he does. He says, I want all the sheep penned up in a rocky patch, no eating, right? And I need all the stonemasons here at sunup. So at sunup the next day, he stood on the steps of the Oropagus, and he said, release the sheep onto a grassy knoll. And he prayed a famous prayer. It goes like this. Oh, great unknown God, please forgive us for our ignorance of your great name. We just don't know who you are. But if you'll be kind to us, oh, great creator God, for in you we live and move and have our being. For you, our God almighty, would you be kind to us, oh, great unknown God, for we are your offspring. Show us what pleases you. Whatever sheep lies down, despite being starved, we'll know that's the sheep that pleases you. But whatever sheep grazes normally, we'll know that's the sheep that doesn't please you. Please show us. So the sheep go into the grassy knoll. Most of them start eating because they're hungry. But a couple of them lie down. And so Epimenides said, I want you to build an altar right where they lay and inscribe it, an altar to an unknown God. And they did. And they sacrificed the sheep and the plague lifted. So from that day forward, the Athenians kept all their gods. But the unknown God was the God Almighty, the creator God, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Paul shows up 700 years later and says, you've been worshiping him for years. I guess it's about time you knew his name. Some people know it. They just can't name it. If you want to read the best book I've ever read on this topic, it's a book called Eternity in Their Hearts by Don Richardson. It's a famous missionary and he wrote about all these cultures he went to, and instead of preaching at them, he listened to them. And what he found was, was that Christ was at work before he got there. And he was just supposed to help them name what was going on in them all along. Some people know it. They just can't name it. Some people name it too loud. <laughs> they just don't know it. Jesus warned us about these people. Jesus said it this way, quote, beware of people who wear their tassels too long. Beware of people. Wear, that's a weird statement, isn't it? Hey, careful with people whose tassels are too long. See, see in Jesus' day, your tassels on the corners of your garment was an indicator that you were a, a, an observant Jew. They had been conquered a lot. It was a multicultural society. The way you uh, identified yourself as a religious person was with your tassels. You know, the tassels were the original cross around the neck, the original fish on the car, the original WWJD bracelet, the original Christian t-shirt, right? Jesus is like, beware of people who were too loud announcing what they believe and not loud enough demonstrating a life of love of how to live. Beware of people like that. Let's put it to today. Beware of people who would rather be known for what they believe instead of how they live. Beware of people like that. Beware of people whose fish on the car is a little bit too big. Beware of people like that. 
Beware of people who would rather announce their doctrine instead of live a life that means something. Beware of people like that. Beware of people who would rather complain on the internet about other people's immorality instead of turning on the light and showing people how to live. Beware of people like that. Beware of people who share that meme on their Facebook wall because they're not ashamed of Jesus. Ah! Beware of people like that. Are we being clear enough? <laughs> so there's this guy named Pilate. And Pilate crucifies Jesus. That was normal. They crucified lots of people. What wasn't normal was resurrection. We'll get there in a second. But, that, but, but crucifixion. And what they would normally do is they had to, they didn't have to, but they, they announced to people why this person was being tortured. That way you wouldn't do it. And so this is what Pilate says. Uh, next slide. Yep. Yep. Yeah, next one. Yep. Uh, and, and over his head, they put a charge against him. Jesus, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. In Luke's gospel, it says, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, and let it be written in Greek, Latin, and Aramaic. Which leads to this question, how big was the sign? Right? You got a billboard over a guy's head. Well, well what they would do is they would write it in longhand in Greek, because everybody could read Greek. And then in the sub-languages, they would put it as an acrostic, right? Now, here's the problem with that. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, here's how you write that in Aramaic. Check this out. Next slide. Yeshua, a Nazarite, Vamelika, Hayudim. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. If you write that as an acrostic, over his head, Pilate wrote, here is yud he vav Hey, if you don't know what that is, that's Yahweh, which is the highest name of God. So over his head, Pilate puts a sign, here is God. So the chief priests get ticked at this, and they go back to Pilate, and they say, take the sign down, bro, you can't write that. And he says, I am so confused with you people. I've written what I've written. It's late. Go away. So over Jesus' head, Pilate says, here is is the Lord. Here is God. Pilate named it, but when you look at his life, he used his power, energy, and resources to oppress people instead of serve people. He named it, but he didn't know it. How about us? When we read the Bible, we always read ourselves in as the good guys. Have we ever been guilty of naming it without demonstrating it? My great-grandfather was illiterate. I'm not mad at him. No one taught him to read. My great-grandfather made his living moonshining. If you don't know what that is, that's running illegal liquor across state lines. That has nothing to do with showing your bum. <laughs> wow, it's amazing. In Australia, you have to explain that. Um, my great-grandfather was in the Ku Klux Klan. My great-grandfather was an illiterate, moonshining racist. My great-grandfather was on the board of directors at the church. My great-grandfather's full faith was in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross to forgive his sins. My great-grandfather lived in a city where 94% of people went to church every Sunday and Wednesday. But in the same city, it was illegal for a black person to go to a white dentist. Think about what that would have taken. The Christian white dentist got together with the Christian city council, who got together with the Christian city leaders, who got together with the Christian city pastors, and they made a policy that made black people go to vets to get their teeth fixed. Some people know it. They can't name it. Some people name it. They don't know it. My great-grandfather died in heart surgery. Where did he wake up? Well, that's above our pay grade, isn't it? But let's say he went to heaven because his faith was in Jesus. That means he woke up at a table with every tribe, tongue, and race. Is he in heaven or hell? To the racist, heaven is hell. 
And that's why Jesus' invitation was never simply go to heaven when you die. It was have heaven so established in you now that when you do walk into heaven, you don't get whiplash. Some people know it. Can't name it. Some people name it. We're Christians. I'm a Christian. And when you look at their life, they don't know it. Some people receive Jesus' offering for them, but they don't offer anything back. There was, a, um, there was a part of the crucifixion story that I found confusing. Um, I do not want to be gross in any way, but, um, but I do want to be historically accurate. And let me be frank, crucifixion's gross, okay? Um, everybody probably saw Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, right? Once, right? You probably didn't see it twice. It's hardly leisurely Friday night Netflix viewing, you know, let's watch somebody get beat up. Um, but that was like it was. It was like dehumanization. Um, you're naked. You're pinned up 18 inches off the ground. People can mock, spit, scourge, whatever. They beat you half to death before you even get there. And it was just horrible. But, but there's, this one, there's this one part that I never understood because... They're being cruel all day. And let me be clear about this. The Romans would not have let you help him. That, that wasn't a thing. You had to humiliate. That was it. And, um, but there's this one line. Check this out. Uh, next slide. A and one of them ran at once and, and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. So, so what happened is, is Jesus says, I'm thirsty. Now, what should have happened is, oh, are you now? Oh, really, son of God? How about make some water for your mouth? Are you serious? Hey, oh, are you thirsty? Oh, something mocking, something mimic, something uh, joking, or something like that. They, they don't. Somebody goes, oh, he's thirsty. Get him something to drink. And then not only do they get him something to drink, they give him alcohol, which would have made it better. Like, it's like, wait, wait a minute, what's going on here? I didn't understand until I took a course in first century, uh, in ancient history, in ancient Roman history. I, I took the course because I enjoy learning things. Um, and I, I thought it would make me a better pastor. I thought it would, um, it would help me understand, like, the Battle of Philippi, for instance, and Thessalonica, and Galatia, and things going on. And session six of this thing, I almost missed it because I thought it would be boring. It was on first century Roman hygiene. Um, and trust me, the world's getting better. Um, if, uh, if we woke up tomorrow in first century Galilee, we'd throw up in 10 seconds and we'd be dead in three days. Uh, our bodies wouldn't handle it. Um, it was just disgusting. Um, the, the, the Romans uh, were horrible people. Uh, when they took over, uh, according to the most conservative estimates, there was 120 million slaves out of 170 million people. Uh, that's a lot. Government sanctioned slavery for over half the population is worse than today. Okay, so, um, and, and, but, but it wasn't all, look, look, here's what they brought. They brought murder, rape, pedophilia, uh, full birth abortion, uh, bestiality, like uh, horrible, horrible, horrible things. Slavery, terrible, but it wasn't all bad. Um, one, of the, one of the positive things they brought uh, to places like Galilee was modern day technological plumbing, right? And so, so before the Romans got there, the Jews in their houses had a designated toilet bowl. All right? D d don't panic about that. You do too. There's a designated bowl in all of your houses that people are supposed to go to the toilet. And if someone went to the toilet like on the floor, it'd be weird, right? So th th that's, that's your designated. But your toilet is hooked to plumbing that then pulls everything out. Th this was just a bowl, like a, a bowl you'd find in your cabinet. And it was a designated toilet bowl. You would go to the toilet in the bowl, and then when you were done, you'd throw it out, right? And so the Romans were like, yeah. What are you, animals? Like, we have better technology for this. So they introduced modern-day plumbing for that day to that area. And they put these public bathhouses um, in the communities. I, I, I found an artist's rendition of this. Let me show you. This is a, there it is. You beat me to it. That's an that's a, that's a artist's rendition of a public toilet. Um, and, this was a, and you might think this wasn't gender-specific, right? And it's kind of like out in the open. You know, it's kind of just out there. You can't be embarrassed. You're like, hey, Jim, what would you have for breakfast? Well, you're fixing to find out. It would be that, right? And so you, you, you've got all kinds of just crazy stuff. But this is a massive improvement on a bowl, right? And the problem was is, how did you clean yourself? Well, there was only four options. One was a fig leaf, which weren't readily available. Two was moss, which was more readily available, but it was messy and it had bugs and stuff in it. 
Th third was your bare left hand. So you just cleaned yourself with your bare left hand and then cleaned it as good as you could. That's why in the first century, you would never say, how you going? Never, right? And, and oh, by the way, as an aside, um, if I was a class two person and you were a class two person, I would hit you with my right hand. But if I was a class two person and you were a class eight person, I could call you less than human by hitting you with my left. In other words, you're not even worth my good hand. I'm going to hit you with my poo-poo hand. It was that, right? Well, wait, remember, remember Jesus said um, to a bunch of class eight peasants, what did he say? If someone slaps you on your right cheek, what do you do? Turn the other cheek. That's not passivism. That's only present the side of you that makes them address you as an equal, and it will shut that stuff down. That is, anyway, so your, your, your third option was your bare left hand. Uh, your fourth option um, was the beggars. So the beggars started a, a bum wiping service, and what they would do is they would, uh, they, would, they would go collect sponges, and they'd put them on sticks to create distance. And if you wanted to use their service, you would just, you know, call them over, and you'd lean forward, and they'd get up behind you, and then they'd, you know, they would just, they would get in there. And then, and then the problem was is how did you sanitize the sponge? So what they would do is that in every public toilet, there was a bucket of undrinkable wine and vinegar. And they would swirl it in the bucket, and that would sanitize the sponge by first century standards. If you look at the at the man on the right in the photo behind us, um, it's pixelated. I get that, but he's holding a sponge on a stick. If you um if if you don't believe me, all you have to do is Google first century Roman toilet paper, and um, uh, this is the second hit that will come up. Next slide. Um, this is explaining how it works. But and again, it's pixelated, but you, you'll see it. Um, it says a sponge stick, the ancient equivalent of toilet paper, well known from literary sources. So Jesus is on a cross giving his life for these people. And one person there was cruel enough for his offering back to Jesus to be a public toilet bum wiper. And what was Jesus's response? Forgive him. Which is really confronting in at least two areas. When we read the Bible, we always read ourselves in as the good guys. We would never be that guy. Hold on. Um, in this story, Jesus is offering his life for this man. And this man's offering back to Jesus was a dirty Roman sponge. How about us? How's our offering back? How's our anger? How's our lust? How's our tendency to call people fools? How's our greed? How's our pride? Yes, I've received, do I want mercy for myself and then justice for everybody else? Or have I received Christ's offering for me, but my offering back is a dirty Roman sponge? It's also incredibly confronting about the limits on Jesus' love that we self-impose. Like if you don't do something, Jesus is going to, what? This guy's response to Jesus was to lift a sponge on a stick. And Jesus' response even to him was forgiven. He doesn't know what he's doing. Which leads to all kinds of questions about where we limit the love of God for people we're engaging in our places of work, our neighbors. Some people know it. We just can't name it. Some people name it too loud. We just don't know it. Some people receive Jesus' offering for them, but they're offering back not very nice. Now, great sermons aren't meant to be agreed with nor disagreed with. They're meant to be wrestled with for application. So if you're the type that can only listen to the first three minutes of a message and then you tune out, and then when you feel it coming to a close, you come back, now's your time. This is your moment. I want us to wrestle with a few things, and I want the musicians back up. Um, uh, a couple of questions. One, when ministering in a multicultural context, can we assume that Christ has been at work before we got there? That Christ has been at work in whoever we're talking to. It's not like, oh, I've got something you ain't got. It's like, wait a minute, no, no. No, Christ is at work. I love the way Paul says it in Ephesians. The, the body of Christ is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Assuming in our places of work that, I don't know, God has been at work in these people's hearts, whether they can name it or not, it's a whole other thing. Some people know it. They just can't name it. Can we help them name what God has been up to all along? 
One of my favorite Hebrew words in the whole Hebrew language is the word kased. I know, I realize in English that looks like the word cheesed, but it's kased. Kased is a word that gets translated loving kindness, but it's basically God's intent to treat you as you are worth despite what you might deserve. It's how far the love of Christ goes to treat people as they are worth instead of how they might deserve. Um, how far does that go revealed in Christ? The only pure theology is Jesus. The only way fully to see God is Jesus on that cross. A God that lays down his power and shows love despite what people deserve. I wonder how we could show that a little bit better. Let's say it this way, next slide. If our life is an incense offering to Jesus, what's it smell like? If our life is being lifted as an offering to his nostrils, is it a sweet smelling aroma of love and generosity and compassion and joy and peace and kindness? Or is it a dirty Roman sponge of anger and lust and greed and calling people idiots? If our life was an incense offering, what's it smell like? Perhaps the best way to think about today is this. Jesus has given his life for us. What's our offering gonna be back? And the only Appropriate response to Jesus' sacrifice is exaltation, surrender. I, I, I almost was reticent to end this sermon with a song. Just because this is what I don't want happening. I don't want people going, well, I sang my song to Jesus and now I'm done. Well, no, no, wait a minute. No, no, no. Your life is an instant. This has to be some sort of starting point, some sort of moment that we go, okay. I surrender again. I exalt you in your right place. So I thought of a hundred ways I could end this sermon, but I landed on this one. Um, with no one leaving, because this is kind of a part of the sermon, I just want you to stand up. You've been sitting long enough anyway. And I want us to engage into a time, a short time, of exaltation and surrender, introspection, a place where with no shaming or guilt that we can go, Jesus, let no one ever reject you because of the way I'm presenting you. Jesus, I've received your offering for me. May my life's offering back to you be sweet and not a dirty Roman sponge. Let's sing together just for a second. Night and day, Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day. Forgive us for excluding our enemies, the people we think are out there. Forgive us for not acknowledging your work in all people. May our life be an incense offering of compassion, grace, peacemaking, generosity, joy, peace, love, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness.
you so much. May we be a part of your morning. Hope Jesus just got bigger. The cross worked better. The resurrection is central. Scriptures got bigger and smaller. I'd like to take a second and invite you back tonight. If you know me, I've been coming since 2006. I always put the best sermon aside for the evening on Sunday night. That way I can invite everybody back. It's true. And I've got something very special set aside. So come on back tonight. Give us an hour and 15 minutes of your life. See what God might do. If you come tonight and it doesn't change your life, I'll personally, out of my own pocket, refund whatever they charge you to come. Grace and peace, everybody. Come on, put your hands together. Hallelujah. God is good, isn't He? He comes down to our level to reach us where we are so we can show His love to other people. Let's just sing this, just this song, just once through. We're not going to uh, prolong the meeting, but just... Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. As if you're lifting your heart to it. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. As if you're lifting your heart to it. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day. keep you secure for God is for you and not against you and may the Holy Spirit continue to commune with you and lead with you lead you throughout the rest of the week we hope to see you tonight good morning God bless you go and chat have fellowship and enjoy each other's company encourage one another to love and good works and everybody said amen good morning <laughs>